going to be over in the 105th Psalm. Of course, it being Thanksgiving Sunday. Uh, it's an exciting Sunday because it means that for the remainder of the year, we will be in the holiday season in some shape, form, or fashion. Uh, we're going to begin marking uh, the Christmas season, uh, the Advent season, a season of waiting, like I said, next week. Uh, today we pause to give thanks, we'll move in, we'll celebrate the birth of Christ, and then we'll be into a new year. Uh, time moves quickly, doesn't it? I mean, it just feels like 20 minutes ago uh, we were in here. My first, uh, my first year at Finley, was, I don't even know how to count that. Uh, it was wonderful, it was blessed, and it was... Can I just call it a headache? Not because of y'all, but because of everything we dealt with together. I mean, it seems like 20 minutes ago we were just in here. Well, y'all weren't in here. We were in here preaching to empty rooms and recording videos and trying to make it through that season. And then the holidays rolled around and we so badly wanted to celebrate the holidays. And we didn't know how to keep people healthy and we didn't know how to keep people safe. And we tried to celebrate this and we couldn't celebrate that. And we couldn't do it this way, but we could do it that way. I actually came across uh, cleaning out my desk. That actually happens. And I think this is the first time since I've been at Finley that I've cleaned it out. Uh, but it does happen every couple of years. And I was cleaning out my desk the other day and came across a stack of signs that said, Welcome, this pew is available. And I thought if I showed these to the church, we would go out back and have a bonfire and burn those things. But we made it through, right? We leaned on each other whether we agreed or didn't always agree or didn't know the best call or didn't know which way to go, we made it, and God has blessed us through it. Now we come through another year and we approach the holiday season and we come to this point in time of giving thanks. And we come to Psalm 105, which is a psalm of thanksgiving. And you'll notice it is a long psalm, uh, 45 verses. Uh, so I will read the psalm, uh, and then y'all can go to Sunday school and then come to second service and I'll preach the psalm. Uh, no, I'm only going to be emphasizing the first seven verses this morning. Um, but the Bible commentator and pastor, uh, Matthew Henry, who uh, kind of wrote the go-to set of commentaries for biblical studies back in the 1600s, he made a statement about this. He said, if you look through the book of Psalms, you will find many, many psalms of thanksgiving. Uh, probably the most famous one is the one we talked about if you were at Young at Heart, Psalm 100. Uh, but there are many psalms of thanksgiving. And he said, this psalm is a long psalm of thanksgiving. Some psalms of thanksgiving are short. And he said, for us, there should almost be a relief in that. Why? Because do you ever sit down to give God thanks and you kind of get nervous because you're like, well, what if I forget to thank him for this? And it looks like I've left something out. Or maybe you sit there and you think, maybe I've got to just, if God's really going to feel like I just have been thankful to him, I need to make sure I list everything, right? And you list your family, you list your kids, you list your dogs, you list your house, you list your cars, you list your job, you list the food you ate, you list the food you ate last Tuesday, you start thanking him for your toenails, you thank him for everything. But what Matthew Henry says is there are times in our devotional life where we have those moments where we just get before God and it seems that we overflow and overflow and overflow with all of these things to be thankful for. Then there are times where there's just a time for a short and simple thank you, Lord. And God is honored in both. We don't need to feel like we have to be overly holy. Uh, we don't feel like we have to show the world to steal a phrase from another preacher that we're Jesus' little brother and we're better than everybody else. But rather we should simply be humble and thankful to God. And so here we have a long psalm of thanksgiving. I'm just going to read these first seven verses. I'm actually going to read the first eight verses. I don't know what I told you, Scotty, but I apologize. I'll, I told you seven, didn't I? I'll just read on into the eight. Thank you, sir. Verse 1, O oh, give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him, sing psalms to him, talk of his, all his wondrous works, glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those rejoice who seek the Lord. 
Seek the Lord and His strength. Seek His face forevermore. Remember His marvelous works which He has done, His wonders and the judgments of His mouth. O seed of Abraham, His servant, you children of Jacob, His chosen ones, He is the Lord our God. His judgments are in all the earth. He remembers His covenant forever, the word which He commanded for a thousand generations. Let's pray together. Father God, we do give you thanks this morning. This morning as we look at this passage on thankfulness, help us to turn our hearts to see how to truly live a life that is reflective of being thankful for all that you've done for us and for who you are. Lead us this morning. And if there's someone here who is not a believer in Christ and has never been saved, I pray that today they would realize that the thing that we ultimately have to be thankful for above all else is a Savior who came to give his life for us and that they would come to know that Savior this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanksgiving's wonderful, isn't it? Y'all know I'm going to have to put a food illustration in here, right? And we start getting excited. And I'll just tell you, I mean, it is a rough week to be my belt. I I mean, most weeks are, but this one especially. Because Thursday we had Young at Heart Thanksgiving. Yesterday... We had Aunt Pat's Thanksgiving. Where were I invited all of y'all? And didn't y'all were the only ones there? And then Papa ate so much he's not even at church this morning. Bless his heart. He's in jail. I thought he wasn't going to jail till next week. We are recording this service this morning, by the way. Papa fills in teaching Sunday school at the jail, just so nothing gets carried out of here that doesn't need to get carried out of here. So Papa's in jail this morning. So we had Thanksgiving yesterday. We got church Thanksgiving tonight. Sure, there will be plenty more to eat throughout the week. And then there's Thanksgiving on Thursday. And then we start having Christmas parties and Christmas dinners and Christmas celebrations and all those fun things. So there's a lot of food buzzing around right now. And the whole reason why is food associated with Thanksgiving takes us all the way back to that very first Thanksgiving where they ate and feasted to celebrate the abundance that God had given them. This summer when we were in New England for Hannah's family reunion, we took a day trip over to Plymouth, Massachusetts. Uh, We saw Plymouth Rock. If you've never been to Plymouth Rock, it sits in a little cage. Um, I don't know, I feel like it's a little bit bigger than the Lord's Supper table here. And there's just a rock in the middle that's engraved 1620. They say it used to be a lot bigger, but before they put it in a cage, people would come chunk off souvenir pieces of Plymouth Rock. So now it's just a little rock. And you got to walk the streets of Plymouth and be where the pilgrims are. And we went out um, where they've actually reconstructed Plymouth to look just like where the pilgrims, uh, how they would have built their houses. You could go sit in a recreation of their church. You could walk down and talk to the actors who never broke character and pretended you were a pilgrim too. It got really interesting, uh, especially if you asked them where the bathrooms were. Uh, I'll leave you to imagine that. They never broke character. They pretended it was still 1620. And then the greatest thing I thought, visiting Plymouth, Massachusetts, going through all these historical sites and thinking of what the pilgrims endured and all their hardships and all they'd been through, is that when you go to the concession stand at the Plymouth Village there in Plymouth, Massachusetts, for about $27, they will sell you a full-blown Thanksgiving dinner. So you can say you ate Thanksgiving. Now, we went the second week of July, but you could say you ate Thanksgiving dinner right there at Plymouth. And I thought, isn't that the American dream come full circle? Those pilgrims set out for religious freedom to be able to worship how they felt led, to be able to honor God in the way they were called. They lived such a hard life, went through so much tragedy, uh, learned and settled and grew, and now here we are 400 years later selling tourist versions of their Thanksgiving dinner. God bless America. Amen? But it's all for a purpose. It's all to call us to Thanksgiving, to giving thanks, to remembering God's blessings. And so Psalm 105 starts out like so many of the Psalms of Thanksgiving. Oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call upon His name. Make His deeds known among the peoples. Sing to Him. Sing psalms to Him. Talk of all His wondrous works. Glory in His holy name. Let the hearts of those rejoice who seek the Lord. Seek the Lord 
in his, and his strength. Seek his face forevermore. Remember his marvelous works. Now, I don't know if you realize where I was putting the emphasis there, but there's a lot of verbs that have to do with giving thanks, right? We typically, we typically think of giving thanks as being connected to just saying thank you, Lord, and moving on, which is a great thing. Like I said, there's a lot of benefit in that. But what should a life of thankfulness to God look like? It starts out and says, oh, give thanks to the Lord, but then it immediately gives another command. It says, call upon his name. Now, we could spend all day right here because there's a beautiful uh, doctrinal theological point here. We should give thanks to God for all that he has done for us, all that he has given us, all the blessings we have for our salvation, for life itself, for your family, for your home, for whatever it may be that God's blessed you with. We should give thanks. But then notice it says, call upon his name. Immediately after the command to give thanks to God, by the way, notice that's a command, not a suggestion, not a question, not a request. It's a command to give thanks. God's people should be thankful. It should be our default setting to be thankful unto God. Then it says, call upon his name. You immediately turn around and call upon it. So, wait a minute, wait a minute. Think about this. God has given us so much. The breath in your lungs right now, the clothes on your back, the food you're going to eat after church, the food we're going to eat tonight, the house that you just came from, the car you drove to get here, your, your friends, your family, your loved ones, all these things he's given us. And it says to give thanks to him for it, but then it says call on his name. What does that mean? It means to make request of God, to call out to him for your needs. Now, this is something that has spoken volumes to me this week. Because... And I'm learning from this. I'm not going to say it's like Paul, not that I've already obtained it. But I'm a dad of two small kids. Do you know what happens when you're the parent of two small kids? There is a lot of calling on your name that happens. Mommy, Daddy, Daddy, Mommy, watch this. Look at this. Mommy, Daddy, can I get this? Mommy, Daddy, I need this. Mommy, Daddy, Daddy, Mommy, Mommy, Daddy. Right? If you've had kids, if you've been around little kids, you've been there. You understand there's a lot of calling on, on names. And oftentimes as parents, what we're teaching our kids is to be thankful because what will happen? You'll, they'll ask you for something and they'll want to go their own way. And what do you have to say? You tell them, what do you say now? And then they learn to respond with, thank you. And oftentimes as parents or anytime, maybe you're at work and people are continually calling on you for help or calling on you, you for assistance. And here it can become, I don't want to say burdensome, but it can become tiring, right? To be called on and to be called on and to be called on and to be called on. Yet as parents, I believe it's a calling that we're to reflect God in how we deal with our children and how we deal as Christians and how we deal with anyone. And what does God say? Yes, he's given us all these blessings for which we're to be very thankful, but what does he desire? For us to still call on his name. As a parent, your kids can call on you 500,000 times in a day, but how would it feel if all of a sudden they quit calling on you? Now, some of you that have made it through the teenage years, y'all might understand what that's like until that time they really need you. And then they do call for mom or dad to help. And as a parent, it feels good. It feels right. See, I think Thanksgiving is ultimately a reminder that God loves us. He doesn't give us the blessings that he gives us out of obligation. He doesn't give us the blessings that he gives us just to show off. He gives us the blessings that he gives us because he loves us. And when he lo because he loves us, he not only desires us to return thanks to him, but to continue to call on him. Yet as we call on him and he hears us and he answers our prayer and he's at work in our life and he guides us and he leads us and he does all these things, there's another command that we're given to make known his deeds among all the peoples. That you don't keep silent about it. That as God blesses you, as God moves in your life, as God works, we give thanks to him and we talk about it. When great things happen in your life, you want to talk about it, right? I'm not going to point out anything. I'm not going to say any team names. But when your football team does great, you talk about it. When they lose, to, when they lose you don't talk about it. 
hey, I, I, I can't say anything this year. You notice I stopped short? When God works in our life, we should be eager to talk about it. We talk about the things that we value. We give credit where credit's due when we recognize where it comes from. And if we're seeking to be thankful to God for every blessing that He has given us, every blessing that He has put into our lives, then what that's going to do is eventually it's going to flow out, not just in how we return thanks directly back to God, but in how we uh, broadcast it out to those that we live among and walk among each and every day. That we don't just stop with the direction between us and God, but as God moves in our life, we make it known to others. And I'll say the greatest thing we have to be thankful for is His salvation that He has granted to us. And when we know that salvation, we should not only give Him thanks for that continuously, but we should also seek to go make it known what God has done for us. We sing to Him. We sing psalms to Him. There's two two-way street here when it comes to singing to God. First of all, singing is a way of offering praise. God delights in hearing us sing. It's something He gave us because... Let's think about all this for just a second. Let me go off a little, little bitty side trail, but it all connects. In a world that teaches us that everything just evolved, that everything just happened, that it's survival of the fittest, why in the world do we need music? Music doesn't put clothes on your back. Music doesn't put shelter over your head. Music doesn't put food on the table. But music, what does it do? It delights the soul. It it connects us to something deeper. And I think this is why God calls His people to sing, why there's so many biblical references to worship through song, because I believe music was something that was created to be beautiful and to connect us to God and to be enjoyed by us. So God delights in singing. So on the one hand, we're called to sing to Him as a way of giving thanks and praise. But also, how do you teach kids something? You have them sing it. How many of you learned in school? Maybe you learned your states and capitals by singing it. I'm not going to ask anybody to stand up and do that now because I'm sure for a lot of us it was there and now it's gone. Or you were taught to sing your multiplication tables. Or you were taught to sing your planets, right? I'll never forget being in preschool and kindergarten and uh, the one I can remember because I still use it sometimes. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. And it teaches you the days of the week. Kids sing things because it helps them to remember. So when we're called to sing to God and we're called to sing words of praise, words of psalms, words of worship back to God, not only are we giving praise to God, but we are reminding ourselves and teaching ourselves. How many of you... I could go to you and maybe, I don't know where everybody is in memorizing scripture, but I guarantee you I could ask you to recite some lyrics from Amazing Grace or What a Friend We Have in Jesus or Victory in Jesus, songs that you've sung in praise to God yet have been ingrained upon your heart and they teach you a truth. So in our being thankful to God and worshiping Him and calling on Him and singing to Him, we're constantly being reminded. I hope you're seeing the balance here this morning between overflowing with praise for God and being instructed and taught in His goodness and in His righteousness. We're to talk of His wondrous works. We're to glory in His holy name. It means we're to just find delight in them. We're to have our hearts rejoice as we seek the Lord. As we give God thanks, and I do feel like sometimes we're so quick to just nod at God and say thanks and move on, but what we're really called to do is to find delight in Him. With a spouse, you can say the words thank you, which are critical in a marriage, But if all you do is just say thank you and that's the depth of your relationship, that's going to be pretty shallow. But when you're truly thankful to have a person in your life, you're truly thankful for the ways that they nurture you and minister to you and and are part of your life, what do you do? You delight in them. As we're truly thankful to God, we should delight in who He is. 
Verse 4 says to seek the Lord in his strength, to seek his face forevermore. And to remember his marvelous work. So as we're reminded of what he's already done for us, we're called to seek him more and more, to dig deeper into who he is, to seek after who God is so that we can grow and we can grow closer to him, that we can learn from him and we can delight in him. One of the incredible things about Psalm 105 is that if you go all the way through it, and like I said, I'm going to spare you all the trip through all 45 verses. What he does after these instructions to seek God and to be thankful is that the, the psalmist begins to recount all of the goodness of God, all of his judgments, all of the things that he's done, going all the way back to establishing his covenant with Abraham and how he, from that covenant, begins to set up the stage to rescue and redeem, how he's with his chosen nation of Israel, how God is moving and how God is faithful. And Psalm 105 reflects totally on God's faithfulness as we're called to seek him. And when we come to Thanksgiving, we need to reflect totally on God's faithfulness and all of the ways that God's faithfulness draws us closer to God. But if you flip the page to Psalm 106, which starts out, Praise the Lord. Oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. What it does there is when you get into Psalm 106, which is another psalm of thanksgiving, and most scholars believe that these psalms were written to go hand in hand. Psalm 105 traces all that God has done. And if you read Psalm 106, it traces all that God's people had failed to do. Psalm 106 says to give thanks to the Lord, but then when it begins in verse 6, it says, We've sinned with our fathers. We've committed iniquity. We have done wickedly. Our fathers in Egypt did not understand your wonders. They did not remember the multitude of your mercies, but rebelled by the sea, the Red Sea. Nevertheless, he saved them for his name's sake, that he might make his mighty power known. So while Psalm 105 recounts God's plan for saving man, God's plan for having a relationship with his people, God's faithfulness to that, Psalm 106 reminds us of how unworthy we are of every blessing that God has given us. There is nothing in you, there is nothing in me that makes us worthy of anything that God has done. In fact, the New Testament tells us that, first of all, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And then it further tells us that the wages of sin is what? Is death. The one thing that we are deserving of God to give us is death. Now let's pray and go home. But that's not where the story ends, right? For the wages of sin is death, but the gift, the gift. So wage is something you earn, right? You go to work and you earn a wage. Our sin has earned us death. But the gift, you don't earn a gift, right? You don't earn something that's being given to you. But the gift of God, eternal life. Those are two very different things. And I think Psalm 105 and 106 simply takes close to 100 verses, if I'm counting right. 93 verses to basically give us an insight into what the Apostle Paul was saying in the New Testament. It tells us that God is faithful, that we've rebelled against him, that we are sinners and not deserving of anything. Yet, because God is merciful, he gives us salvation. It says, nevertheless, he saved them. In spite of all the wickedness they've done, in spite of all the rebelling, because God is who God is, he rescues, he saves, and he blesses his children. Why? That his name might be made great. So I don't think it's too much to ask when Psalm 105 tells us that if we're truly ready to give thanks to God, we should continue to call on him, we should continue to seek him, and we should be willing to share the good that he has done in our lives. Y'all all get to talk tonight. I get to talk this morning. And I'm truly thankful. I'm thankful that I'm saved. I'm thankful that knowing my sin, knowing my own unworthiness, knowing how broken of a person I am, 
And knowing that God knows all of that, I'm truly thankful that he loved me enough to send his only son to come to this earth and to suffer and to die, to give his life. I'm truly thankful that when I called on his name for salvation, he immediately answered and saved me. I'm thankful that I have assurance that I'm saved, that I can trust that when this life is over for me, I'll spend eternity with the Lord. I'm thankful for the home in which I was raised. I'm thankful for the family that brought me up. I'm thankful for... Hannah deciding to leave that cold, frozen tundra and come to school in the bright, sunny south. I'm thankful that my friend Will Walker invited me to a study group at the IHOP on banjo night. That is the most romantic love story there ever was. Where this Canadian girl was struggling with her American history midterm that she had the next day. I'm thankful... To have married her. I'm thankful for all that God has seen us through. I'm thankful for the two little boys who run around our house, run around this church, run around Walmart, run around wherever we put them, make our life fun, teach us more about ourselves. Man, isn't that something about parenting? Do you feel like you learn... As you're learning about your kids, you learn a whole lot more about yourself, don't you? I'm thankful for God calling me, unworthy as I may be, to serve in the church. I'm thankful for how God brought us here to Finley with all its twists and turns. I'm thankful for all that we've walked through as a church family. I'm thankful for the Christian people that God has put in my life, the pastors that have uh, poured into me from the time I was a little kid squirming in the church pew, for the sweet church folks who were just there. I'm thankful for the folks I got to pastor at Zion Hill Baptist Church, what they taught me how they put up with me. Thankful for y'all for trusting me with this calling. Thankful for y'all for just being y'all. Thankful for y'all for putting up with me. Thankful that y'all saw fit to allow me uh, to, to, well, I know the Lord calls, but those of you that were here to vote to call me, I don't even know if it was known that I was an Alabama fan at the time, uh, but we made it through that. I'm thankful for those in this church who have gone home to be with the Lord, who I had the privilege of knowing some for just a few weeks, some for just a couple of years. Yet I'm thankful for the mark they've left on my life in this church. I'm thankful for the way y'all serve the way you love one another, the way that God's blessing this church. I'm even thankful for Brother Charlie, his mentorship and um, walking with me. I'm thankful for y'all for loving my family. I'm thankful that y'all uh, care about them and love on them. I'm thankful that we're in this walk together. I'm thankful that we've been given a gospel that can save souls. Thankful that we've been given a gospel that is the only hope in a dark world. And I'm thankful that we are called not just to come sit on pews together, but to walk through life and to go out, as the psalmist said, and to tell of all the good that God has done, to sing praises to his holy name, to worship him with one another. I'm thankful. We know that all of this, as the old hymn says, comes from the fount of every blessing. 
that there's not a blessing in my life that wasn't given to me by the Lord. And for that, I'm humbled that not only does this holy and righteous God desire a relationship with me, with you, with every person that he sends his son to save us, but then as we follow him, he continues to bless us above and beyond. Yet, as the psalmist says, to seek after God, to continue to seek him, to rejoice as we seek him, I think it's as Jesus said, to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, then all these things will be added unto you. I think there's an application there for oh so many things that it's our calling to seek God together, to seek after him, to desire to run from sin, to desire to run to Christ, and then to see how God moves and blesses. So today let us be thankful, let's worship, but let's resolve and commit to seeking, to seeking Christ, to seeking the move of the Holy Spirit, to seeking the leadership of the Lord. This morning if you're a believer, and you don't know where to start with being thankful, start with your salvation. If you're not a believer and you find it hard to be thankful, it's awfully hard to be thankful to a God that you don't truly know. But I'm here to tell you that that God loves you and he desires for you to come to Christ and to know him and to be saved. Father God, we just give you thanks this morning. We give thanks to your holy name. For you're a good God, a righteous God. And Lord, we just thank you. Lord, this morning in this time of invitation, I pray that our hearts would be filled with thankfulness and that we would simply take time and reflect on you and return thanks unto you. But in doing so, Lord, that we would continue to call on your name and realize that all of our blessings come from you, but we're called to seek after you, God. And I pray that as a church this morning, we would seek after you, even as we reflect on all that you've already done. Lord, maybe we need to recommit our lives to you. Or maybe, Lord, there's someone here today that needs to know this Savior who came to give his life for them. Lord, we praise you. And I just pray this morning you would be glorified in this time. In Jesus' name. I invite you.